That night, when Rosa brought him dinner, Matt asked when Maria was coming back. Never, snarled the maid. She and her sister have been sent home, and I say good riddance. Just because their father's a senator, the Mendoza girls think they can turn their noses up at us. Puh. Senator Mendoza isn't too proud to have his paw out when El Patron hands around money. Every day the doctor visited. Matt shrank from him, but the man didn't seem to notice. He grasped Matt's foot in a business-like way, doused it with disinfectant, and checked the stitches. Once he gave Matt a shot of antibiotics because the wound looked puffy and the boy was running a fever. The doctor made no effort to start a conversation, and Matt was happy to leave things that way. The man talked to Rosa, however. They seemed to enjoy each other's company. The doctor was tall and bony. His head was fringed with hair-like fluff on a duck's bottom, and he sprayed saliva when he talked. Rosa was also very tall and very strong, as Matt found out when he tried to get around her. Her face was set in a permanent scowl, although the occasional smile were... She occasionally smiled when the doctor told one of his bad jokes. Matt found Rosa even smiled more horrid than her scowl. El Patron hasn't asked about the beast in years, remarked the doctor. Matt understood that the beast was himself. Probably forgotten it exists, muttered Rosa. She was busy scrubbing out the corners of the room. She was on her hands and knees with a bucket of soapy water by her side. I wish I could count on it, the doctor said. Sometimes El Patron seems definitely senile, but he won't talk for days and stares out the window. Other times, he's sharp as the old bandito he once was. He's still a bandit, said Rosa. Don't say that. Not even to me. El Patron's rage is something you don't want to see. It seemed to Matt that the maid and the doctor shivered slightly. <clears throat> He wondered why El Patron was so frightening, since the man one was said to be old and weak. Matt knew he was El Patron's clone, but it was unclear about the meaning of the word. Perhaps El Patron had loaned him to Celia and would someday want him back. At the thought of Celia, Matt's eyes filled with tears. He swallowed them back. He would not show weakness in front of his tormentors. He knew instinctively they would seize on it to hurt him even more. You're wearing perfume, Rosa, the doctor said slyly. Ha, huh, you'd think I'd put on anything to please you, Willem? The maid stood up and wiped her soapy hands on her apron. I think you're wearing it behind your ears. It's the disinfectant I used to clean out the bath, said Rosa. To a doctor, it probably smells good. So it does, my thorny little Rosa. Willem tried to grab her, but she wiggled out of his arms. Stop it, she cried, pushing him away roughly. In spite of her unfriendliness, the doctor seemed to like her. It made Matt uncomfortable. He felt the two were united against him. When they left the room, Rosa always locked the door. Matt tried the knob each time to see whether she had forgotten, but she never did. He pulled on the window bars. They were as firmly attached as ever. He sat discontent, disconsolately at the floor. If only he could see something interesting outside the window. A section of wall blocked off most of what lay beyond. Through a narrow gap, he, led to some, he could see a green lawn and bright pink flowers, but only enough to make him want more. A thin ribbon of sky in the daylight and n at night showed a few stars. Matt listened in vain for voices. Scar tissue had formed a knot on the bottom of his foot. He inspected the writing frequently. Property of the Alacran estate, but the scar had sliced through the tiny lettering. It was more difficult to make out the words. One day a frightening argument erupted between Rosa and the doctor. El Patron wants me by his side. I'll come back once a month, the man said. It's just an excuse to get away from me, said Rosa. I have to work, you stupid woman. Don't call me stupid, the woman smiled. I know a lying coyote when I see one. I don't have a choice, Willem said stiffly. Why not take me with you? I could be a housekeeper. El Patron doesn't need one. Oh, sure. How convenient. Let me tell you, it's horrible working here, she stormed. The other servants laugh at me. She takes care of the beast, they say. She's no better than a beast herself. They treat me like scum. You're exaggerating. No, I'm not, she cried. Please take me with you, Willem. Please, I love you. I'll do anything for you. The doctor pried his arms away. You're hysterical. I'll leave you some pills and see you in a month. As soon as the doctor closed, Rosa hurled the bucket against the wall and cursed the doctor by all his ancestors. Her face turned chalky with rage except for two splotches of red on her cheeks. Matt had never seen anyone so furious, and he found it terrifying. You're responsible for this, Rosa shrieked. She pulled Matt up by his hair. Ow, ow, yelled Matt. Bleeding won't save you, you good-for-nothing animal. No one can hear you. This whole wing of the house is empty because you are in it. You don't even put pigs down here. Rosa thrust her face close to his. Her cheekbones stood out beneath her taut skin. Her eyes were wide, and Matt could see white all around the edges. She looked like a demon from one of those comic books Celia got from church. 
I could kill you, Rosa said quietly. I could bury your body under the floor, and I might do it. She let him slump to the floor again. He rubbed his head where she had pulled his hair. Or I might not. You'll never know until it's too late. But one thing you better understand. I'm your master now, and if you make me angry, watch out. She slammed the door as she left. Matt sat paralyzed for a few minutes. His heart pounded and his body was slimy with sweat. What did she mean? What else could she possibly do? After a while, he stopped trembling and breathing returned to normal. He tried the door, but even rage had kept Celia from locking it. He limped to the window and watched the bright strip of glass and flowers beyond the wall. That night, two gardeners who refused to look at Matt removed his bed. Rosa watched with a look of bitter satisfaction. She took away the waste bucket Matt had been forced to use since he arrived. You can go in the corner on the newspapers, said Rosa. It's like, that's what the dogs do. Matt had to lie on the cement floor without any covers, and of course without a pillow. He slept badly, and his body ached like a tooth in the morning. When he used the newspapers in the corner, he felt dirty and ashamed. How long could this go on? Rosa merely plunked down the breakfast and left. She didn't scold him. At first, Matt was relieved, but after a while, he began to feel bad. Even angry words were better than silence. At home, he would have been he would have had the stuffed bear and dog and Pedro el Conejo for company. They didn't talk, but he could hug them. Where were they now? Had Celia thrown them out because she knew he wasn't coming back? Matt ate and cried at the same time. The tears ran down his mouth into the dry toast Rosa had brought. He had toast and oatmeal, scrambled eggs with chorizo sausage and a plastic mug of orange juice and a strip of cold bacon. At least she wasn't going to starve him. In the evening, Rosa brought him flavorless stew with cement-colored gravy. Matt knew the Matt was given no utensils and had to put his face in the bowl like a dog. With the stew came boiled squash and apple and a bottle of water. He ate because he was hungry. He hated the food because it reminded him how, Cel how wonderful Celia's cooking had been. Days passed. Rosa never spoke to him. A shudder seemed to have come down over her face. She neither met Matt's eyes nor responded when he asked her questions. Her silence made him frantic. He talked fervishly when she arrived, but he might not have been stuffed bare for all the notice she took of him. Meanwhile, the smell in the room became appalling. Rosa cleaned the corner every day, but the stench clung to the cement. Matt got used to it. Rosa didn't, and one day she exploded in another fit of rage. Isn't it enough that I have to wait on you, she cried as she cowered next as he cried, cowered next to the window. I'd rather clean out a hen house. At least they're useful. What are you good for? Then an idea seemed to occur to her. She halted the myth. The myth she halted mid rant and looked over at Matt as in, a, in such a calculating way he felt cold right down to his toes. What was she planning now? Back came the sullen gardeners. They built a low barrier across the floor. Matt watched with interest. The barrier was as high as his waist, not tall enough to keep him in, but high enough to slow him down if he tried to escape. Rosa stood in the hallway, watching and criticizing. The gardener said a few words Matt had never heard before, and Rosa turned back, turned dark with rage, but she didn't reply. After the barrier was finished, Rosa lifted Matt out and held him tightly. He looked around eagerly. The hallway was gray and empty, hardly more interesting but the room, but at least it was different. Then something happened that made Matt's mouth filled o fall open with surprise. The, gar the gardeners trund trundled down the hall with wheelbarrows piled high with sawdust. They dumped them one after another into his room. Back and forth they went until the floor was full of sawdust heaped as high as the barrier in the doorway. Rosa suddenly swung him up by his arms and tossed him inside. He landed with a whump and sat up coughing. That's what dirty beasts get to live in, she said, and slammed the door. Matt was so startled he didn't know what to think. The whole room was full of gray-brown powder. It was soft. He could sleep on it like a bed. He waded through the sawdust, trying to figure out why it had suddenly appeared in his world. At least it was something different. Matt tunneled. He kept heaving the shavings into hills. He threw it into the air and watched it patter down in a plume of dust. He amused himself this way for a long time, but gradually Matt... Gradually, Matt ran out of things to do with the sawdust. Rosa brought him food at sundown. She spoke not a single word. He ate slowly, watching the tiny yellow light that belonged to the Virgin and listening to far-off noises from the rest of the house. What in, God's, uh, what in God's green earth have you done? cried the doctor when he saw Matt's new environment. It's deep litter, said Rosa. Are you crazy? What do you care? Of course I care, Rosa, the doctor said, trying to take her hand. She threw him off. 
And I have to care about the health of this clone? And I have to care about the health of this clone? Good god, do you know what happened if you died? You're only worried what would happen to you, but don't lose sleep over it, Willem. I grew up on a poultry farm, and deep litter is by far the best way to keep chickens healthy. You, you let the hens run around in it, their filth settles to the bottom, and it saves their feet from getting infected. Willem laughed out loud. You're a very strange woman, Rosa, but I have to admit, the beast is in good condition. You know, I remember talking- re I remember it talking when it lived in Celia's house. Now it, now it doesn't say a thing. It's a sullen, evil-tempered animal, she said. The doctor sighed. The doctor sighed. Clones go that way in the end, but I didn't, did think this one was brighter than most. Matt said nothing. Hunched as he was in a far corner from the pair who could get. Long days of solitude in Celia's house had taught him to be quiet, and any attention from Willow or Rosa could result in pain. The days passed with agonizing slowness, followed by nights of misery. Matt could see little from the, ha from the barred windows. The pink flowers withered. The strip of sky was blue by day and black at night. He dreamed of the little house, of Celia, a meadow so intensely green it made him cry when he woke up. And gradually it came to him that Celia had forgotten him, and she was never going to rescue him from his, this prison. The idea was so painful, Matt thrust it from his mind. He refused to think about her, or when he did, when he, did he quickly thought, thought of something else to drive her image from his mind. After a while, he forgot what he looked like, except in his dreams. But Matt still fought against the dullness that threatened to overwhelm him. He hid caches of food under the sawdust, not to eat later, but to attract bugs. The window wasn't glassed, and all sorts of small creatures could come in through the bars. First, he attracted wasps to a chunk of apple. Then he lured a glorious buzzing fly to a piece of spoiled meat. It sat on the meat, just though it had been invited to dinner, and rubbed its hairy paws as it gloated over the meal. Afterward, Matt discovered a writhing mass of worms living in the meat, and watched them grow and eventually turn into buzzing flies themselves. He found this extremely interesting. And of course, there were the cockroaches. Small brown ones struggled through the sawdust. A big, leathery bom bomber zoomed through the air and made Rosa scream. You're a monster, she cried. It wouldn't surprise me if you ate them. Oh yes, there were all kinds of entertainment and bugs. One magical day, a dove pushed its way through the bars and rummaged through the sawdust. Matt sat perfectly still, entranced by the bird's beauty. When it flew away, it left a single pearl-gray feather behind, which Matt hid from Rosa. He assumed that anything beautiful would be destroyed by her. He sang to himself, inside where Rosa couldn't hear. One of Celia's lullabies. <sighs> Spanish. Buenos dias, Paloma Blanca. Hoy te vego a saludar. Good morning, white dove. Today I come to greet thee. I can't sing or speak Spanish. So that was bad, but <clears throat> Celia said it was going. Celia said it was the song of the Virgin. It occurred to Matt that this dove had come from the verge, and the feather was meant she would watch over him here as she had done in the little house. One day he heard footsteps outside. He looked up to see a strange new face on the other side of the bars. It was a boy, someone older than himself, with bristled red hair and bristly red hair and freckles. You're ugly, said the boy. You look like a pig in a sty. Matt wanted to reply, but the habit of silence had grown too strong. He could only glare at the intruder. In the hazy background of his mind, he recalled the boy named Tom, who was bad. Do something, said Tom. Root around. Scratch your piggy behind on the wall. I have to have something to tell Maria. Matt flinched. He remembered, what, remembered a cheerful little girl with black hair who worried about him and was punished for bringing him food. So she had returned, and he, she hadn't come to see him. That got you, didn't it? Wait till I tell your girlfriend how cute you are now. You smell like a pile of dung. Matt fell idly beneath the sawdust for something he had been feeding to bugs. It was an entire orange. At first it had been green, but time to turn it blue and very soft. Worms filled the inside, diverting Matt with their wiggly bo bodies. He curled his fingers around the orange. It held its shape. Barely. I forgot. You're too dumb to talk. You're a stupid clone who wets his pants and barfs all over his feet. Maybe if I spoke your language, you'd understand. Tom put his face against the bars and grunted. At the same instant, Matt flung the orange. His accuracy was excellent because he had spent days aiming fruits at targets. The rotten orange burst apart all over Tom's face. He jumped back, screaming, It's moving! It's moving! Pulp dripped off his chin. Wiggly worms dropped into his collar. I'll get you for this! He shrieked and ran away. Matt felt deeply peaceful. The room might look like a fe featureless desert to Rosa, but to him it was a kingdom of hidden delights. Underneath the sawdust, 
He knew exactly where caches of nutshells, seeds, boon, bones, fruit, and gristle. The gristle was particularly valuable. You could stretch it, bend it, hold it up to the light, and even suck on it if it wasn't too old. The bones were his dolls. He could make them have adventures and talk to them. Matt closed his eyes. He would like to lock up Rosa and the doctor. He would feed them wormy oranges and sour milk. They would beg him to let him go, but they would not. They wouldn't. Not ever. He finished up the dove feather and... He fished up the dove feather and complimented its silky colors. The feather, you fe the, the feather usually made him feel safe, but now it made him uneasy. Celia and the virgin, virgin loved all kinds of gentle things. She wouldn't approve of throwing a rotten orange in Tom's face, even if he deserved it. If she looked inside Matt, she would see the bad thoughts about Rosa and the doctor. Matt found he was sad, too. I wouldn't really hurt them. He thought so the virgin could see that and smile. Still, he couldn't help but feeling the warm sensation of pleasure having zinged Tom. But as Celia once told him, a smart person doesn't spit into the wind. If you throw a rotten orange into someone's face, you can bet the orange will sooner or later come flying back. In less than an hour, Tom returned with a pea shooter. Matt was clad in only a pair of shorts, so the peas landed on his bare skin. At first, he tried to dodge them, but there was nowhere to run in the narrow little room. Matt settled in the corner, and his head cradled into his arms to protect his face. He instinctively understood that if he refused to react, Tom would lose interest. It still took a long time. The boy outside to him have an endless supply of peas. But eventually, he ca called Matt a few bad names and went away. Matt waited a long time, to be sure. He could be very patient. He thought of Pedro El Conejo, who explored Senor McGregor's garden and lost all his clothes. Matt, too, had lost all his clothes, except for the shorts. Rosa said he would, would only ruin them. Finally, he looked up and saw his kingdom was in disarray. Running around had destroyed the marks that Matt didn't know where to lay, what lay below. Sighing, he worked his way through the sawdust. He felt underneath to find his treasure. He combed the surface smoothly with his fingers and renewed the lines and hollows that told him where everything was. It was much like Celia moving the furniture out to vacuum the rungs and moving it back again. When he was finished, Matt sat on the corner and waited for Rosa to bring him to bring him his dinner. But something shocking and unbelievable happened first. Mijo! Mijo! cried Celia from the window. My child! My child! I didn't know where you were! Oh God, they told me you were with El Patron! I didn't know! She was holding Maria up to the window in the crook of her arm. He looks different, observed Maria. They starved him, the animals, and took his clothes. Come here, darling, I want to touch you. Celia jammed her big hand through the bars. Let me see you, mi vida. I can't believe what happened. But Matt could only stare. He wanted to go. He had dreamed of nothing else, but this moment could actually come. He couldn't move. It was too good to be true. If he gave in and ran to Celia, something bad would happen. Celia would turn into Rosa, and Maria would turn into Tom. He was disappointed he'd break him into pieces. Hey, Egypt, I wouldn't have a lot of trouble to come here, Maria said. Are you too weak to stand? Celia cried suddenly. Oh my god, have they broken your legs? At least say something. They haven't torn out your tongue? She began to wail like La Llorona. She stretched her hand through the bars. Her misery tore at Matt, and she couldn't. he couldn't move or speak. You're squeezing me, complained Maria, so Celia put her down. The girl managed to stand tall enough to peer through the window. My dog Furball was like that when the dog catcher got him. He cried and cried until Dada brought him back. Furball wouldn't eat or look at me for a whole day, but he got over it. I'm sure Matt will, too. Out of the mouths of babies come wisdom, said Celia. I'm not a baby. Of course not, darling. He only reminded me of the most important things to get Matt free. The most important thing is to get Matt free. Celia said, smoothing Maria's hair. We can worry about the other stuff later. I give you a letter. Can you keep it secret from everyone, especially Tom? Sure, said Maria. I hate to do it, Celia said to herself. I hate like crazy to do it, but there's only one person who can save Matt. Maria, you must take this letter to your dada. He'll know where to send it. Okay, Maria said cheerfully. Hey, Matt, Celia's going to put chilies in Tom's hot chocolate tonight. Only you mustn't tell anyone. And you mustn't either, said Celia. Okay. Don't you worry, the woman called to Matt. I've got more tricks up my sleeve than that old coyote has fleas. I'll get you out of here, my love. Matt was frankly relieved to see them go. They were an unwelcome intrusion to his orderly world that he created. He could forget them now and go back to his co contemplation of his kingdom. The surface of sawdust was combed smooth, the treasures hidden beneath the marks only he, that he knew, king, only that he, the king, understood. A bee wandered in and found nothing and left. A spider determined. A spider mended its web high in the, near the ceiling. Matt took out the dove feather and lost himself in its silky perfection. End of chapter 5